and then you pull it. Oh God, you bring justice to the oppressed and give bread to the hungry. Forgive us when we do not follow you. You free the prisoner and restore the sight to the blind. Forgive us when we do not follow you. You support the downtrodden and protect the stranger. Forgive us when we do not follow you. You block evildoers and help orphans and widows. Forgive us when we do not follow you. You bring about justice and true peace among people. Forgive us when we do not follow you. Please remain standing as together we sing the opening hymn, Here I Am, which is on page 589 of your hymnal.
Friends, hear and proclaim the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Um, it's unfortunate. 
unfortunate, I guess, that for us as humans, sometimes that is necessary. So, for me, it started really early in life. Um, my brother and I, we grew up in a little town of Wolf Lake, Illinois. We'll say we grew up. We started there. We started Wolf Lake, Illinois, which is about the size of Zell. If you know what Zell's like, then you can relate to Wolf Lake. We moved to the big city of Anna Jonesboro in 1963. All right, Anna Jonesboro was considered a city to us. I mean, it was Jonesboro 1,700, Anna 4,500, collectively 6,200. Um, we became city people. Uh, <clears throat> from the community that we started out in, they did not get a kindergarten. So when we got to Jonesboro Elementary, which went all the way through eighth grade. Uh, they had a kindergarten, but we got there in March, so there really wasn't any point in listening or enrolling us for a month. So Randy and I didn't get to do kindergarten, no big deal, right? So when we get to first grade, now when I say Randy and I, for those of you who don't know me, I have a twin brother. And I always tell people, uh, we're identical twins, but he's a lot bigger and uglier than I. <laughs> uh, is what it is. He's not here to defend himself. Uh, <laughs> if he were, the proof would be here. Okay. So, first grade, second grade, third grade, Rick Shaver is having a lot of trouble in school. Um, and right or wrong, back then, they would kind of put the kids over here that could get it. And they would put the kids over here that couldn't get it. And for whatever reason, in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm falling over here. I mean, I just, I don't know what's going on, but I can't get, you know, can't make it happen. So at the end of third grade, I'm coming home every day with a headache. My mom says to herself, well, something's going on here. I'm going to go get his eyes checked. Nobody ever checked. Our eyes. So I still remember to this day the doctor, I'm not getting all the hard way to go about the fact she had never had taken me to an island because as far sighted people go, we can still see stuff. But to reprint like this, unless it's super big, we can't do it. So <clears throat> the doc says he can't breathe. He can't get even these, you know, maybe the very top, but certainly not good enough to resist. He needs corrective vision. So I got my first set of glasses. What were they stopped? <laughs> um, going into fourth grade now, I can see. And I can read what the other kids were able to read. And I was on a mission. I wasn't going to be over here with kids who couldn't anymore. So fourth grade and eighth grade, um, I had sixth grade a teacher named Mr. Hayes. He was really tough. I think I got a beat or two in his class, but the rest of the time it was just Hayes. And like I said, I, I was now determined to prove that I could. Apparently, had the ability I wanted, just couldn't see. At the end of eighth grade. Um, at that school, they recognized the valedictorian. And our class size was about 50, so it wasn't like I was one out of three. You know, people say I got third grade, so I never had race three. <laughs> but, yeah, so they ended up giving that valedictorian thing to me. Um, it turned out I was a pretty good athlete. I was Boarded like the best shooter on the basketball team, the best shooter on the baseball team. Life was pretty good at the end of eighth grade. And then my world was about to turn upside down. And then when I got to high school, we went from our smaller school to a bigger school. And so they outnumbered us two to one, and consequently, um, you know, we kind of became insignificant. We were just kind of there fill in the periphery, but we weren't the key players. And unfortunately for me, I didn't grow until I was pretty much 
especially my sophomore year. I got to high school at 5'2", 105. Well, there's not a lot of places on a high school football team, basketball team, or baseball team for a guy that's 5'2", 105. And what makes it worse is not only was I not getting to do, you know, the things that I knew I was good at, um, when you're 5 2 one on 5 you kind of got a target. So, you know, when I watch the shows on TV now about bullying and stuff, I think, yeah, I don't know what that's about. Um, because you're just a target. When you're that little, you're just a target. And people, um, right, wrong, or indifferent, this is not something that's just happening in the 21st century, they'll pick on you. And going on since I was a kid. So high school was not real fun. Um, I tried, I guess, the best I could to deal with the circumstances I was dealt. Finally, I did grow. Uh, when I got my license at 16, I was 5'4". Uh, by the December of that year, I was 6 foot. So I went 6 inches in 8 months. Um, but now, at least, the coaches and stuff can look at me and say, well, I think he can play. Uh, he's at least big enough now. I think he can play. Um, but I had missed three years of competition. So, you know, that was not good, unfortunate. But at least I got, I kept my participation in baseball as a bench player. And finally got my chance, my senior year, to play. And it was a good year. Um, the only real highlight out of high school for me was being the best hitter on the baseball team, getting elected MVP. Finally, something good came out of high school. Um, and then we moved on to college. And college, as everybody knows, is like this new slate. It's a clean slate. You really don't know other people. They don't know you. Whatever you've got inside you, it's going to drive you to succeed. You get a chance to do it. Now, don't have all the peer pressure and all the other social stuff going on. So college was good. And then I got through college, and I was taking a class to study for the CPA exam, and this guy was sitting next to me named Mark Carter. And Mark was the son of a partner, one of the partners in the firm that my wife had to be working in. And so Mark sat there watching me go through the class stuff, and he figures out that hey, this guy kind of knows the stuff better than the rest of us. But we need to offer him a job. So we did. So I got lucky to get my first job without really even an interview. Things are still going pretty good. Marsha and I ended up getting married in a couple of years, and she kept chasing me around the office. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the firm that we were with, it, uh, it kind of went through some evolution. Uh, Harden and Drysdale partnership split. Me and Harden went to another firm. You guys did your thing for a while. We ended up back together. And in the end, Marsh and I were two-fifths of a five-partner firm. And that was in 1985. Okay, well, I'm thinking things are going pretty good. You know, 85, we're 27 years old, we're both full partners in a CPA firm, pretty young age. Um, and then we went on vacation, was that May of 86? Late May. Um, great trip, went to Hawaii. Only time I've ever been there. Uh, we come back though, and it was Monday morning, and they call us into a partner meeting. And dropped the bomb on Marsh and I that uh, you guys are out. And we're looking at each other and thinking, really? But when you're two out of five, they have control and you don't. And so then we go home and look at each other. We got a house that we got to pay for, you got bills and stuff. We're thinking, we're both out of the job, so now what? Uh, well, I, you know, after, you know, some consternation, of course, and a little bit of anguishing, um, having went through what I went through, 
particularly in high school, I knew things weren't going to get better if I just sit around and then, you know, dwell on how difficult this is. There's only one way to make it better. We're going to have to actually go out and start over. And Harden, as it turns out, which is Skyward, uh, his name's still on the firm. I'll never tell you all. Uh, he was available. And so we hooked up with him and formed Harden and Shaker in 1986. And then from there we got to where we are now. And I was so fortunate that he partnered with us. Well, we both were. But he trained me to do research and he was very good. His first degree was at MIT when a guy from St. Louis could get into MIT. Second degree was in accounting. He went past CPA, whatever that process was back then. And then he decided, well, you know, a lot of the stuff that we're looking at evaluating is contracts. I need to get a law degree. So he went and got his law degree and passed the bar. But Missouri, you have to practice that more than the other. So very educated, very intelligent. Um, it was certainly a great thing for me to be in the right place at the right time with the right people to give me what I have been able to utilize for my work career. So, how does all this no pain, no gain stuff relate to what's going on here? And so, I guess I've been coming to this church since the early 80s. Marsh and I first started together. Uh, we got married in this church. Of course, we lived in St. Louis for a lot of years, but um, one of the difficulties that this church as a congregation has faced has been um, transition of, of pastoral leadership. Okay, we've had a lot of temps, we've had a lot of part-timers, we've had a couple full-timers, but they stay for three to five years and move on. And so I think what that has done is it's made this congregation have to step up and take, you know, take leadership roles that you might otherwise not have to do because there's somebody up there that's kind of directing all this stuff. Um, so I, I come across um, a pastor who was assigned to a church, actually it's in our presbytery, and this pastor was telling me that the challenge in this church is the people that had the same pastoral leadership for 20 plus years, which has been great for them, but this guy did everything. And so now this interim pastor is coming in and sees people just kind of sitting expecting, you know, I guess the interim now to do everything there, which is not that interim's job. And the biggest challenge that this interim has told me he's up against is getting the people back activated, you know, energized, taking on responsibilities. But we haven't had that problem here, I think, because you know, we didn't have that luxury. And I think those of us that, you know, are participating with, you know, either Sunday school or BBS or whatever it is, you know, the music here is awesome. Uh, I think this is where we really get our reward. I mean, this is where we really get to feel um, that, you know, the, the the, the true joy comes from that service. We can sit, you can listen to me, or you can listen to Steve, and you can go through those motions, but when you actually get out there in the field and start working the ground, and seeing the produce comes up, it's a lot more meaningful to me. And I, for one, you know, I'm glad and thrilled that we have so many people in this church that's willing to get out there and get their hands through. Uh, it's made this ministry far more complete, it's made it far more Resilient. And I want to, the last thing I want to talk about is the house next door. I mean, you talk about a challenge, the house next door, from beginning till now, has been a challenge. Um, first, you know, we had to get the place. There wasn't a lot of, you know, there was a lot of concerns about getting it. Do we really 
really need it? Can we use it? What do we do with it? And we kind of got through that process. We were being accused of doing things neglectful with other stuff about the house that absolutely wasn't true. Um, we had to kind of ward that off. We had to start a campaign to raise money to actually fix it. Um, we ended up with, you know, the blessing of the Jeffries Foundation coming in and offering to pay for a third of that cost. Uh, we had to raise the other two thirds, which we were able to do. Big numbers. Um, you know, <clears throat> without the committee and specifically Becky's involvement in that, we wouldn't be where we are. And when I think about Becky, I think about Paul. Maybe we should probably call him. <laughs> It takes somebody with that kind of persistence, resolve, resilience to get us from our one band to where we are now. And that is that person. So we do need to we do need to build character. You know, Paul talked about that, in Romans he talked about it in other scriptures, Corinthians. You know, endurance, character, hope. Um, they do not come without that order. I mean, unfortunately for us to actually grow and develop death, we have to endure. And out of that endurance, we build character. And it's out of that character then that we can have hope. And that's the message that I want you guys to have today. I speak God. Okay. Our next uh how do we do this? Affirmation thing, okay. I haven't quite got my spring doll into the short service thing, but Steve's uh more better at mine. So Join me now in the affirmation of faith that's printed in your bulletin. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one trying God, the Holy One of Israel, the one alone we worship and serve, with believers in every time and place. We rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. So now we come to the point in our service where we offer our gifts back to you, Christ. Here on.
thank you for these gifts. We ask that you would take them and further your ministry here in this church and this community and throughout the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be saved. Come now to the point of service where I will offer up a pastoral prayer. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this church. We thank you for its ministry. We thank you for all the people that came to join us yesterday here in this church. And when that was a joyous experience, we pray now for this denomination. We pray for our presbytery. Continue to guide them. Lord, in the direction we have for them and for our future. To change the future, changing lanes, to constantly in your direction and your discernment. We now pray for our country, pray for our leaders, pray for all those that still come out to serve in uh, police and first responders. Continue to be with them, encourage them, strengthen them, and guide them. And now we pray prayer that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive.
heard of those, so you know it's down to good. Um, now, all right, everybody here, you'll have a great week. We wish a blessing on each and every one of you and all that you do. And may the love and peace of God and Jesus be with each and every one of you. Amen. Mm -hmm.